All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of 10 years to learn Wing Chun, lots of, yo, the KFG got some surprise announcements for your ass. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm doing really good, Sifu. You doing really yeah, good? Yeah, I, I had the best week ever. The best week ever? Why? Because I just beat you up for an hour? Beat Is that, that why? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the few, because you're like a busy man now. You, you like, the, after this podcast blew up, you know, we have almost 10,000 subscribers, right? That almost, yeah. Almost. That's pretty cool. Uh, which is huge, man. I yeah. mean, just like worldwide. Like, we're yeah. taking over, yeah. right? And we got uh, it in a month. Yeah, and now, yeah. <laughs> It's like two years to get such a piddly audience, right? Uh -huh. uh, you are like super busy now. It's like you're the you're the main attraction, man. Like I said, anytime I go somewhere where people like know the podcast, they're always like, "Yo, where's Dre?" And I'm like, "Dude, I'm the Kung Fu genius. Don't you care about me?" Everyone's like, "No, no, no. Where's Dre?" So right. now you're like Mr. Busy. You can only make it to City Wing Chun once a week, which once is why is we no longer record on Mondays. We record on Saturdays, and. To get your own training in, I now have to get here at the crack of dawn Ass to crack teach dawn. you, yeah. then do the podcast, and then teach the rest of my Saturday schedule. I wake up 5.30 every morning during the week, mm -hmm. and now I wake up 5.30 on a Saturday. I know, but it's, that's to get your training it's, in. It's, 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 yeah. It has to get done. That's right. That's yeah. right. So here we yeah. are. Another episode. Last week, we had a Phil Collins-inspired episode because we found out that our Producer and that sound was engineer, really cool. Mikey Dean, loves Phil yeah. Collins and loves Genesis. I'm glad we were able to do that. Because yes. no. it, was, it, was, it was like, he needed that. He needed that, yeah. yes. Yeah. We, like like we, he needs a whole. We saw he head. was a little depressed about yeah. some randomness. Yeah. yeah, And we did that and he was, his spirits were lifted automatically. Absolutely. At the end, he was so happy. Yes, All yes. Right. So, uh, here we are, ready to answer another round of questions. I By the way, I, I, before we do that, I got a couple, couple interesting what things coming down the pipe. First of all, uh, it looks like we're going to have two interview episodes coming up. We have not done interview episodes in a bit. Uh, the main reason I want to do interview episodes is so I don't have to look at you for the whole episode. I know. This all right? gets to get rid of you. Well, it's by, it goes both ways. No, it doesn't go both ways. <laughs> all right? It's a two-way street. There are no episodes where it's this just you and not me. This is a one-way street? Right? No, it's a one-way street. No, it's going right? to be one-way street. So um, I have procured Why do you two... think I, I get Dre's for a day? I get him, yo, can you do Dre's for a day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't have to look at you. That's why. No, it's no. The it's, same it's, thing. it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So you don't have... I don't have... So you don't have... Yeah. So anyway, I procured cured two Bruce Lee themed guests and Ooh. two people that I've never talked to before. So not the usual suspects. Mm. All right. Although I would love to get John Little back mm. on. Uh, I, uh, and, and also Matt Polly. Um, I, I'm going to have Steve Carriage. Okay. So Steve Carriage is a, well, very difficult to describe Steve Carriage. He's an author and he's written a number of books about Bruce Lee. In yeah. my opinion, He's written some of the best books. He's about one of the Bruce OGs uh, uh, on the Bruce Lee uh, writing. Uh, no, I wouldn't say he's an OG. I would say he's a, his books are more recent, but mm -hmm. his books are extremely thorough. Like so, Ooh, he goes, okay. he he'll go into, for example, like the uh, the making of like like Big Boss or something like mm -hmm. that. And he'll go through all the stories and details and background stories and everything like in a way that is. You don't really see that in a lot Damn. of other books because obviously a lot of other books about Bruce Lee, if they're not a biography, they're usually focused on uh, his philosophy or his martial art of Jeet Kune Do. But there's this whole, you know, two year period where um, Bruce Lee became this huge star in Hong Kong. I mean, you have to imagine yeah. it's kind of like middle end 71 and then mm -hmm. middle of 73 he dies so the whole mm. thing of him making you know big boss and fist of fury and way of the dragon and starting game of death and and doing enter the dragon this is this is like basically within a two-year less than two-year window right so Damn. him becoming that That's star a is a very a short time. time but most of the books that are written about bruce lee obviously focus for good reason on jeet kune do his martial art all that kind of stuff but i'm also extremely fascinated with this very short but what, perhaps the most important period of Bruce Lee's life in terms of obviously world recognition. Mm -hmm. And Steve Carriage has written a number of books where he just, he's he even mentioned some things that, you know, have been pet projects of mine, like the Lao Tai Chun story and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, 
And his books are really high quality. He, he always uses the best version pictures and prints of everything he can get. So if you haven't seen any of uh, Steve Carriage's books, I would highly recommend ordering them. They're a top quality. Everything he does is, is really right. top notch. So uh, we're going to have Steve Carriage on. And I'm yes. going to have a chance to talk to him about this, this time period. I'm, I really want to focus on uh, that time period of Bruce Lee making films and like behind the scenes stuff and stories and things like that. So really excited about when that. When are you looking at this? Um, we're, we're, I think we're going to record it. We're going to record it next week, but Ooh. I don't know when it's going to come out. Because as you know, sometimes we record episodes mm -hmm. in advance. It depends on our travel schedule. So uh, I, we're going to record it next week. So by the time this episode comes out, we would have actually already recorded it. All but right. I, don't, I don't know when that one will, will hit. And then uh, after that, the other one I'm going to get is Dr. James Bishop, who oh. just uh, finished a new book called Who Wrote the Tao? Okay. I thought you was going to say Dr. Eisen, though. Dr. Eisen? No, yeah. I would love to have Dr. Eisen yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I would love to have him on the podcast. At arm's length. No, yeah. no, no. Right here. Right. All right. <laughs> yeah. Right where I can use my yeah. wing chun. Oh. Not far away. All right. No, not too far. Uh, if he's too far away, I have to beat him yeah. with a long you pole, right? Pull him. So, um, yeah, no. So, uh, Dr. James Bishop uh, yeah. just wrote this book about who wrote the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Mm. Because uh, I think what a lot of people uh, should realize, but maybe don't, is that the book Tao of Jeet Kune Do um, is not really written by Bruce Lee. Um, it, it came out in 1975, right. and it was essentially it's a year collection. I was born. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, disastrous year. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it was a collection of his notes. Mm. And when it was originally sold in 1975, it was promoted as if the book was completely written by Bruce Lee and illustrated by Bruce Lee. Shit. And um, I, and, and, you know, and then in recent years, in ensuing years, and then in more recent years, like the whole question of, well, who actually wrote this kind of kept popping up because it was pretty clear that a lot of the things that were in there were like verbatim passages that were out of other books, right? Mm -hmm. And so then even like Joe Rogan one time on, on a podcast a number of years ago was like, yeah, well, I heard Tao Jeet Kune Do is plagiarized or whatever. And it's like, calm down, Mr. Bro, all yeah. right? Uh, the, the Tao Jeet Kune Do, all right, mm -hmm. which by the way is a kind of a silly name. Um, <laughs> because, how, how so? Because Tao mm -hmm. is a bad spelling of, it means the way. Okay. But it's a Mandarin spelling, all right? And actually in Mandarin, it should be pronounced Tao, Tao with a D, all right? Mm -hmm. But normally when it's written or anglicized, they will write it with a T. Okay. But it means way, all right? What does Jeet Kune Do mean? Oh, so you're basically saying way twice. You're basically saying way twice <laughs> and in two different dialects. Yo. Because Tao is kind of a bastardization of Mandarin. The and way of Do, the way. Do is uh, the way in Cantonese. Okay. All right. Some people think he copied it from like Taekwondo and they're like, oh, or, or like Bushi Do. And they're like, oh, it's Jap. No, it's not. Actually, that same character yeah. is pronounced Do in Cantonese and also in Japanese. All right. Ouch. The same character. But Ouch. that doesn't mean that he took it from the Japanese. That is literally the Cantonese pronunciation. Yeah. And, the, you know, I, and me being such a Bruce Lee nerd, I didn't realize that until I was uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah. And I saw they had the book Tao of Jeet Kune Do for sale in a Chinese bookstore. And then I saw the Chinese title. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> because You're it looking was... you like, what the... In, in, uh, of course, the word order is different in uh, Cantonese and Chinese, but it was Ji Kun Do Ji Do, which is like of the way, Ji uh -huh. Kun Do of the way, uh -huh. right? Because you have to reverse it, right? right? But it's the same Do twice. And I'm like, oh, that's clunky. The Tao yeah. of Ji Kun Do uh -huh. might as well be the Do of Ji Kun Do. Okay. All right. Which is kind of ridiculous. All right. The way but, of but the, the way. whole thing about that book is that that was, that was uh, contrary to Dragon the Bruce Lee story. Mm. Uh, that was not uh, published during Bruce Lee's lifetime. That was published in 1975. So we're looking at two years after he died. And I think it makes sense because, you know, uh, Linda Lee uh, basically sold Bruce's half of Concord Productions to Raymond Chow. Now, so this she, is his she, top selling book. 
Or yeah, but let, let me explain okay. like what, what happened. Like uh, Linda sold Bruce Lee's half of Concord Productions to Raymond Chow. Mm, and mm. basically, from what I understood, forfeited any royalties from any of Bruce Lee's Chinese films, right? And so, she, because remember, Bruce Lee was, even though it's kind of hard to imagine that now because he's so, he's like one of these icons, like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Elvis or something yeah. like that, right? But back then, uh, he he wasn't quite what he is now. He was like, some people knew about him and he was big in Asia until yeah. the martial art guys knew about him and then he died suddenly and his movie was a hit, but they hadn't quite capitalized on this Bruce Lee fever until like the 70s would roll on a little bit and then knew he would become a bigger and bigger deal. Mm -hmm. And so Linda thinking perhaps that whatever she could get from selling Concord back to Raymond would be all she would ever get because wow. that would be kind of the end of the Bruce yeah. Lee money train. She kind of did that perhaps hastily. And then in 75, when people are really starting to look for Bruce Lee stuff, mm -hmm. she now needs something to sell, right? Because she, she, she's not getting money from those films or the rights from those things, right? So what does she do? She takes his notes and puts them into a book mm -hmm. and then publishes publish it as the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, and then the original advertisements were like, it is the, uh, it's written and illustrated by Bruce Lee. But that wasn't entirely true. Now, I'm picturing her get, gathering all these notes, mm -hmm. putting them, laying them, laying them down on a desk or on the floor or something, mm -hmm. and and putting them in the order. No, no, she I'm had someone help. No, with I'm this. pretty sure. I'm pretty sure someone helped. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a team. I mean, I think the book. So, J, so Dr. James Bishop wrote a book called "Who Wrote the Tao," and what okay. he did is he went through the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, yeah, page by page. Oh, and wow. his, what's great about the book, and I'll talk about this more when I have him on, is that his book, like if you're on page 10 of his book, those are the source notes for page 10 of Tao of Jeet Kune Do. So you can literally put the two books side by side. Wow. And, and it'll tell you like passage by, by passage play. what books Bruce Lee got it from. And I think the reason why that's really important is because it's unfair to Bruce Lee to say somehow that he plagiarized these books because those were his notes. He wrote a majority of those notes when he hurt his back in 70 or early 71. Okay. Which was from actually... Doing, one, from doing the good mornings. The good mornings, right? Yeah. When he's supposedly... Not from an elbow right. from one jacket. No, a flying kick to the back. Like a flying kick yeah. to the back, yeah. Um, Who does yeah, flying kicks exactly, to the back anyway? Exactly. What a, what a punk, all right? Um, and so he, when he was kind of uh, convalescing, he... Mm -hmm. he um, Convalescing is a he great started word. to write those notes, uh -huh. and those notes were just notes from the different books that he, um, you know, that he was taking inspiration from. So there were things from Krishnamurti, uh, boxing books, fencing books, all sorts of stuff. Wow. And he was writing notes because those are his notes. He's not publishing them as a book. Right. He's not pawning them off as something he wrote. Those are his those notes. Those were his private notes. Those are his private notes. Yeah, for himself, his, yeah. right? And then occasionally he would take some passages. And uh, like of a boxing passage said like, you know, the art of boxing rarely attacks directly. It uses uh, feints and misdirection before it attacks. And then he would change that to Jeet Kune Do mm -hmm. because he's trying to formulate this style using these boxing and fencing ideas, right? But again, there was never any intention that this was going to be published openly, right? So, wow. so you basically saw all these great notes. It was kind of like the holy grail for Jeet Kune Do practitioners. But then over time, people were like, uh, but the, the, these are like almost verbatim from, you mm. know, book, boxing books by Hazlitt or even uh, some illustrations from Jean LaBelle's judo books and things like that, right? So the Tao of Jeet Kune Do should have been called the notes of Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my personal notes. <laughs> my right? personal notes, Yeah, bitch. I didn't make this shit up. Right? <laughs> yeah. These are my notes. <laughs> these are my notes, right? bitch. <laughs> but that's not what they did. So, so unfortunately, O'Hara Publications kind of pawned it off. Mm -hmm. And even when you see the illustrations, you can see that those are actually, Bruce actually did illustrations or I should say re-renderings of photos that were in those books. And I even mentioned it to you, I think on an earlier podcast that I bought like secret uh, f Asian fighting arts of the world uh, last year, and I got the same edition Bruce Lee would have had, which was like a you know mid '60s edition. And when I was thumbing through it, and I went through like the um, Indian martial arts section and the Thai martial arts section, yeah. I saw photos in there, and they immediately were familiar to me. And I was like, ah, 
Bruce Lee sketched these photos, and mm. those are the sketches that are in Tao of Jeet Kune Do, right? Sweet. And so it was interesting. So I just got the book yesterday. Uh, so. Um, uh, and you read it Dr. already. Dr. Bishop was, was uh, uh, kind enough to send me an advanced copy so that uh -huh. I can look through it before oh, I interview sweet. him. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was tearing through that thing last Shh. night. And then even when I went to bed, I was like about to go to sleep. Oh, and I'm no. just like, and I wake up and I'm like, Arr! and I just like, no, I have, to, I have to like keep looking. Because what's interesting about it is uh, it doesn't have any of Bruce Lee's original words in there. It has the original sources where those notes came from. So now for the first time, those uh, those authors and those sources can get credit and you can see what's great about it. It's not to say, oh, Bruce Lee didn't write this stuff. We know he didn't write it. They're his notes. Mm -hmm. It's to say, where did Bruce Lee get this? Where? What are the books and the sources mm. that inspired Bruce Lee to create his wow. Jeet Kune Do concept? So, for the, so now you can actually know this is from this book. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see all of his uh, um, influences on the, uh, from the philosoph philosophical side, like Zen and D.T. Suzuki and then Krishnamurti and Alan Watts and all this stuff. You kind of, but you can now see passage by passage where this came from Krishnamurti, this came what? from here, this came from here, right? So um, it's really fascinating. So I'm geeking this is out. A must have. I'm geeking. Yeah, yeah, if you're a Bruce Lee Jeet Kune Do aficionado, I think you. Uh, I rarely endure. Like there are a few books that I think are really obviously John Little's books are fantastic because he did a much better job, in my opinion, of putting together Bruce's notes and categorizing them into the different books and like mm -hmm. the letters of the dragon and all that stuff. Yeah. Like John Little's work for the Lee estate. Um, is kind of the the giant that everyone is kind of rest like sitting on the shoulders of of John Little's work, right? Mm -hmm. And then since then, you know, there've been some, you know, like I like really like the Matt Polly biography, which is just yeah, very like kind of has like everything in it. Yeah. Um, and then, but I think all the dirt, you know, and obviously uh, Steve Carriage's books, which are more about the the entertainment side of what Bruce Lee did and the movie stuff, right? But in terms of like the the Jeet Kune, like if you're a Jeet Kune Do practitioner, all right, uh, or you have a mild interest in Bruce Lee's thought process, like you have to have this book. You have to have a copy of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do and this book, so you see them side by side. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't really recommend it enough. I, I was, I was uh, you know, he contacted me. I had never heard of him before last week, even though John, obviously he, he knew John Little and John Little speaks very highly of him, and I had never heard of him. I don't know all the Bruce Lee guys. And uh, he sent me the, He said he would send me the book, and, and he did. And I was like, oh, wow. And the beautiful thing about the book is there's even a passage in there from the late Big Sean. Because, Goodness gracious. Yeah, That's at the, amazing. At the time that uh, Big Sean passed, apparently he was working on some project, I guess, with, with uh, Dr. Bishop, some yeah. Jeet Kune Do related project. Um, I don't know whether it was this one or for some upcoming one. And uh, according to the book, I think they're going to continue to do a some similar projects with some of Bruce Lee's other writings and where the sources of it, the various quotes that always get, um, you know, attributed to Bruce or whatever. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, this but yeah, great. there's like this little blurb there with uh, big Sean Madigan, where he talks about like, you know, what he thinks the, uh, significance of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do is, and it's great. It was just so nice to see him. And it was weird. It kind of sent me, because uh, he told me that he was in the book, and then when I got the book and I went home and I started reading it, uh -huh. you know, and I saw Big Sean or whatever, kind of like brought all those feelings back a little bit. So like, I, you know, I texted John, his son, mm -hmm. and like, yeah, last night was kind of like one of those miss, uh, you know, Big Sean nights, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'm super excited about this book, so I'm super excited about interviewing him. So And when um, will that take place? Soon, soon. So yeah. I just don't know when it's going to come no out. No like. Yet. Um, as soon as I can tear through that book, which okay. at this rate will which will be by tomorrow, okay, uh, <laughs> right. I, uh, uh, I I will get him. We I'll you know we'll do. He's in Texas, so it'll be through okay. Zoom anyway. So uh, and then we'll have that. So we'll have a couple really awesome Sweet. Bruce Lee uh, themed interviews coming up. Sweet, and then I spent twenty minutes talking about that before we got to the first question. Dre, if you want a day off, just ask. Stop trying to beat around the bush here. Like, oh, so when is it then? I mean, just just get. When can I get? Yeah. You know what I mean? Am I going to be replaced? Yeah. Yes. So anyway, 
Uh, <laughs> he is going to be replaced. So maniacal. You know he's been gunning for your yeah, job yeah, the whole time, right? So You're going to have to learn sound soon. It's a deviant. Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for KFG fans. Right now, you can get an all-access one-month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right-hand corner. Fill out your email and password and use the code KFG trial to get your free trial to all the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right, all the issues, even the one with this cool guy on the cover. That's me for those of you listening to us on audio. My Kung Fu Genius column is also in all the new issues as if you needed another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And now back to me. All right, so uh, what questions you got for me, man? First off, we got Luis Herrera. Luis Herrera? Yeah. All right. All right. Are you ready for Luis Herrera? I am ready. Okay, let me, let me position, reposition myself to Okay, read. so you can read. <laughs> you gotta get in your reading back. position. My back is yeah, all jacked. Man. Yeah. Hi, Sifu Alex. Love the podcast. You guys are awesome. Thank you. I have two questions that I'm hoping make it to the podcast to have them answered. First question is with all of the Wing Chun out there, no matter the lineage, you always seem to see just chain punches. You never really see the Wing Chun guys throw on hooks or uppercuts like the lifting punch in WT. Mm -hmm. Great. Should we stop with that Why question? Why is or are you that? Gonna ask me all the, okay. All right. You uh, want me to answer that before we go to question two? Or you want to give me all the questions and then I'll do one by one? All right. Give me the other questions. Go ahead. Also, it seems to me like some Sifus structure their students' membership within their associations so as to keep them loyal. For years and taking more than a decade to learn the entire system, including the weapons. Honestly, at times, I felt like Lun Ting had a similar structure. Having trained in Kung Fu over 25 years, I know the importance of solid basics and fundamentals, but I've also seen some students with the ability to pick up quick. Has breaking away from the IWTA allowed you to have the freedom to have students excel at their own pace? Thank you. Much respect to you. You are one of the few instructor, instructors that I admire that teaches very well in fine detail and is very astute and can, exp uh, astute and can explaining things clearly. All right. All right. Great. That's a fantastic question. Some great I compliments agree. in there, right? Uh, I yes. Agree. Okay. So uh, for the first one, okay, why do we mostly see Wing Chun people doing chain punches and not doing other things like hooks and uppercuts or the lifting punch? Well, um, in certain lines of Wing Chun, it's a little bit con controversial as to whether Wing Chun has a hook punch or not. In the Larenting system, we have a hook punch. It's in the Buji form. It's in the third form. And it's pretty contextual in terms of when we use it. So we don't just like stand there and willy nilly throw a hook at someone, right? I do. Uh, you do, yeah. But that's because you, you're about you do about sixty percent what I teach you, and the rest the rest you watch uh, Master Two on uh, Instagram and follow him, right? Uh, so what? So uh, of course we have, a, but the idea is when we use the hook punch in Buji, it's essentially a straight punch from the side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I've, you know, pulled my partner at a 90 degree angle, right, and I apologize for those of uh, you who listen to us on audio, right, but yeah. if I pull my partner and I'm at a 90 degree perpendicular angle to them and my hand is here mm -hmm. and their face is there, well, in this position, it makes no sense for me to bring my hand back to the center mm -hmm. to give them a punch or a palm. That would oh. actually take too much time. So from this position, the most efficient way to punch in a straight line is to do the hook punch right to their throat. Yes. So we do the hook punch as essentially a straight punch from the side. To the throat. Okay. If my hand happens to be on the outside while I'm turning and spinning, and that is the most direct line to hit, well, then that makes sense. Yeah. But we're not going to stand in front of someone and then launch in with a hook punch only to get countered by by a straight or a cross, right? Okay. So, And again, I think part of the problem is because people still conflate um, why are you doing Wing Chun and how are you training it and what are you training it for, okay? Mm -hmm. If your idea is to spar back and forth using a kickboxing frame, all right, so we're going back and forth. We're testing distance, okay, I throw feints, you know, I see how you react, I move, maybe I, I draw you to come in and overextend yourself and then I crack you with something, right? Okay, that is different 
from what we're really doing in Wing Chun, okay? Yes. The idea in Wing Chun, okay, is uh, if, if it's not a 1950s challenge fight with another Kung Fu style, where you just stand there in the Zhong style back and forth, and when they come too close to you, you just run in and do some chain punches, okay? We're talking about modern day, all right? Mm -hmm. How are you gonna use Wing Chun? Well, hopefully, if you're practicing regular, you know, good, practical, self-defense oriented Wing Chun, you're not thinking, oh, I'm gonna go step into the ring using this tactic, because all tactics are contextual. So if someone stands in front of you, you're at a bar, you know, the guy's in your face, he's screaming, you put your hands up, you're like, hey man, take it easy, I don't want any trouble, right? And the guy, you, you cannot verbally de-escalate, you know, the guy, you know, is yeah. super aggressive, keeps coming at you, and then which suddenly- Which happens to Mikey Dean. Which happens to Mikey often. Dean in, here in yeah. this school, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, you know, and you basically have no other choice. You've exhausted all your other options of mm -hmm. trying to de-escalate. And now you have to do something really quick. The guy standing in front of you, he's very close, he's angry, you're there, and you know he's about to move, he's about to take a shot. You need to go in there and do something really quick. So we're talking about, we're not talking about bridging a huge gap. We're mm -hmm. talking about the guys in your, this is like in New York. Someone's in yeah. your face, right? Guys on the subway, yeah. like right there, whatever, and you boom, if oh. you're gonna do something, it has to be a quick action. Yeah. We're not talking about, okay, bro, all right, let's go out back, let's go back. Ooh, man, yeah. good jab. Ooh, uh, watch footwork here. Oh, you try uh, to shoot. Like, right. This is a kickboxing frame, okay? And yes, that type of thing can happen on the street, but usually it happens when you're street fighting. And when you're street <laughs> fighting, you signed up for that. I yeah. don't mean you literally signed up for it. I mean, if yeah. you're going back and forth with someone, all right, like this, all right? You, you probably decided that you yep, want to do that. Catch me outside. Right. Now, there, of course, there are different circumstances. You're getting cornered and the guy's moving. You're trying to keep distance or whatever. But there are even tactics from a self-defense frame that are not about going back and forth and, t you know, checking them with the jab. And then you, then you get your hook in there or whatever, okay. right? And I think the problem is that when people say sparring, it's always assumed kickboxing uh, uh, format. All right? God. Touch gloves, go back and forth. Okay. And look, you can do that. Uh, but that's not really what Wing Chun is designed for. Wing Chun is designed for, okay, I'm right here, you're standing right there, it's very close self-defense, right? If a Wing Chun practitioner wants to be able to use their Wing Chun in distance back and forth in that kind of kickboxing format, well, then you need to learn something about kickboxing and, and boxing and rhythm and timing and distance and stuff so that you basically have to move like a kickboxer at distance, mm -hmm. And then when you get close, you can become, you can go more and more into your Wing Chun stuff, right? Which is to a certain degree what Bruce Lee did using fencing for distance and getting in close and doing some Wing Chun, although that's a overly simplified trope. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and again, it's easy to say, okay, Wing Chun should be like this and not like this. When someone's standing in front of you, you do what you got to do, right? Uh, this is, these are just simple theories and simple ideas. But um, I think part of the problem is that when you have these knuckleheads like Ding Hao and these guys who try to challenge MMA guys, they are at best somewhat understanding of what Wing Chun can do, but at worst, they don't admit that what they're practicing is not for this thing that they're about to oh, do. Oh, man. Okay? So if, oh. you're going to, if you're gonna fight with an MMA guy using Wing Chun, well, I have news for you, all right? You need to learn some MMA, uh -huh. all right? You need to learn some kickboxing. You need to learn some wrestling, both stand-up, takedowns, maybe some jiu-jitsu on the ground, mm -hmm. right? And some MMA-style striking. And when you have that as a base, you can slip your Wing Chun in because what you're doing is not what Wing Chun is designed for. It's kind of back and forth um, contest between two people. When you're trying to protect yourself, the situation that you end up being in is different from touch gloves, let's go back and forth. All right. And the problem is that it's not saying that that's, I'm not one of the guys that say, oh, MMA is not real because they're rules. No. If uh, you're locked in an MMA cage, all right, no, you, and there's another dude situation. in front of you, that's a very yeah. real situation, yeah. dude. All right. That's very real. Uh -huh. So I'm not one of those traditional martial art guys who's like, you know, uh, well, there's there been no real Wing Chun person who went into MMA and yeah. stuff like that. It's also, MMA is mixed martial arts. You have to have a blend of different styles. You have to have some some striking skills, some wrestling skills, some jujitsu skills, and these things have to kind of come together, right? There's no one single style that can completely dominate our, for a long period of time in MMA anymore, right? But for some reason, traditional martial arts, mm -hmm. which 
for for a large part now have have been pretty integrated into MMA. I mean, not to beat a dead horse, but you see Wing Chun ideas from Matt Brown, mm -hmm. from Anderson Silva, you know, like some fighters use some ideas that are very, very Wing Chun, like mixed in with the other stuff. But there's no one, no one there's no boxer that goes right. in there and just boxes and beats everyone. And there's no wrestler anymore that just goes in there, maybe at the lower levels or maybe for a while, but they eventually get figured out in order to, yeah. to compete at a high level, you have to mix what you're doing. But then people look at a traditional martial art like Wing Chun and go, yeah, how come no, there's no Wing Chun people going in MMA? How come there's no just karate guy going in MMA? Well, All back right? in the day in UFC, that was like the format and then they had to yeah, but, adjust but, everything. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, that, that yeah. we saw the results of yeah. that, right? And the, the thing is that to be successful in mixed martial arts, you have to mix your martial arts, <laughs> all right? Like Leota Machida was like uh -huh. a karate fighter who was also a black belt in jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. and trained, you know, kickboxing and, you know, came from the Shuto camp with Anderson Silva and stuff like that. So it's not like he went in there having just a purely traditional karate background and then went in there and did his thing. So if, if the other traditional martial arts like karate or... Um, you know, other uh, uh, forms where you see bits and pieces from traditional martial arts. None of them are going in there as a pure version of representation of those arts. Mm -hmm. No one says anything. But like Wing Chun, it's like, how come there's no Wing Chun guy who goes in there and MMA? How, they do, there's no pure jujitsu guy anymore. The, the, the pure jujitsu guys maybe last at the lower levels, but mm -hmm. at some point they're going to have to learn striking. Gordon Ryan is the best jujitsu guy in the world. Yeah. He seems to be toying with the idea of going into MMA, and guess what he's training? Striking. And he's the best jujitsu guy in the world. No one can touch him in jujitsu, okay? <sighs> because now, oh, now he's gotta do MMA. Oh, Yo, how come he doesn't just go in there doing his jujitsu? Because he'll probably win his first few fights and then people will start figuring it out. Yeah. If they can keep him off of them from taking him down, they're gonna figure him out with other stuff, right? So it's why it's called mixed martial arts, right? So, um, and so I give part of the blame to the critics for that, but I also give a bigger part of the blame to the Wing Chun practitioners who don't understand what I just spent the last five minutes explaining to you. <laughs> because they see that Wing Chun is like effective in certain contexts. All right. And they see that as being universal. They go in every single context, you're gonna be able to fight like this and defeat an enemy like this. And uh, no, because the moment you take a Wing Chun fighter out of a self-defense based context, all right? And I would even argue a lot of them are not that great at that either. But if, if they train it, that's where they could thrive. But then you put them in the ring and now they have problems because they don't have those skills. Mm -hmm. So to come back to this question when people say, well, how come I don't see hooks and uppercuts in Wing Chun? I go, are, are you talking about the idiots who go in with classical Wing Chun into a kickboxing or MMA format? Okay. Yeah, they probably don't really have, they might have those techniques in their Wing Chun school, but maybe those are low percentage techniques. Yeah. And when they're in there, they don't have enough experience to even make their chain punches work, let alone the rarer punches in Wing Chun, oh, all right? right? The bread and butter is chain punches. Uh, how are they gonna make these rare things work when they're in a situation where they're a fish out of water, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like if, if you are, you know, when Hoist Gracie was on top, beating everyone in UFC, right? okay? If you just took that hoist crazy, he was beating everyone in UFC, put boxing gloves on him, and put him in the ring with a mid-level boxer of his weight class, he would have gotten his ass kicked. <laughs> oh, and then man. would the takeaway have been, man, jiu-jitsu sucks. Oh, man. Yeah, the great hoist crazy who beat all these big dudes, you uh -huh. know, when there were no rules. Yeah, but look, when you put him in a boxing ring, what happens? <clears throat> what a loser, right? That's why all the internet people say, don't, don't do shit and don't practice. Yeah and never got their ass kicked and don't understand how very real it is that you know you have to respect people who train hard and have good skills. And you cannot just say because you do XYZ style that you somehow are imbued with skills and abilities that the normal person doesn't have. You are as good as you've trained and no better. You're not a, you're not a scrap better than what you've trained. And whatever forum you decide to fight in, well, hey, you better be good at that, all right? So the, uh, uh, the, the Wing Chun, there, there was, a, there was a, a, a bad showing for some of Yip Man's students when they went to Singapore in, I think, 1967, 1968. They mm -hmm. wanted to do some full contact fighting because uh, at that time, full contact contests were still illegal in Hong Kong, which is also part of the reason why 
the only way you, these guys tested each other's skills at were these rooftop fights in mm -hmm. the 50s and 60s. Because people say, well, how come you know, they didn't go to kung fu tournaments? Because they, they weren't allowed to have kung fu tournaments in those days. The Hong Kong government assumed that you know, all Chinese martial arts had something to do with uh, triads or illegal activity. So they weren't going to sponsor that. It wasn't until Tang Sang and the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Art Association came in and they started to change the attitudes and the mindset of the Hong Kong citizens that the mm -hmm. uh, fighting contests started to become uh, legal. And then you had uh, full contact Kung Fu and you had Thai boxing and all sorts of stuff in Hong Kong, but that was really in the 70s. So, um, so unlike some of the other martial arts that had a chance to kind of start testing their metal in the ring, mm -hmm. even if it was just point karate, at least they were going back and forth. Thai boxing obviously was already competing. And by the time the Kung Fu guys got into this culture of competition, they were kind of like the Johnny come lately's, right? And so uh, that's the reason why, you know, they didn't have this culture. So in the late 60s, they sent some Wing Chun students to Singapore because there it was legal to do a fighting contest. Yeah. But that was also the early days of Kung Fu fighting contests. And the equipment that they had to wear was uh, like a... Um, almost like a fencing helmet, mm -hmm. you know, like completely enclosed and it had these like crazy, I think it was actually a kendo helmet, like for the yeah. Japanese sword fighting. And they had to wear that in these huge bulky chest protectors and these like, like they were basically in these padded suits. And the Wing Chun delegation from Hong Kong, the first time they put on those padded suits and that helmet was in Singapore when they were gonna go for the fighting contest, right? Yeah. Whereas the locals, had already maybe had a few contests where they were used to that equipment and because they knew the equipment, they trained with it. Um, it's the same thing like when we do our big technician tests or student level nine tests right. here, usually in the weeks leading up to it, I tell the students, uh, you need to do all your conditioning and sparring training with the full gear, yeah. all right? I mean, you do the training with the gear anyway, but like if you're gonna hit the heavy bag, do it with the elbow pads and shin pads and mouth guard and everything in yeah. because if you just put that on on the night when you suit up, like you're used to wearing your gloves and your mouth guard in training, right? And you do your sparring, maybe the elbow pads, right? But unless we do kick stuff, maybe you don't put on your shin pads or maybe you don't put on your knee pads. And now you have everything on yeah. and you've only done that a couple times with everything, all right? Like at that, at that level, right? Then you're going to feel like a little off, right? For the senior students, it's not a big deal because they train with that equipment all the time, right? But the juniors, they're maybe not quite as used to it because they're just starting. So they should be hitting the heavy back with all the equipment, including the mouthpiece, because you have to get acclimated to that stuff, right? And so there's, there's a big point of that. Another reason why the Wing Chun guys, I think, do really poorly, besides the fact that, in my opinion, they're delusional in terms of what they can do. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think sometimes the first time they're wearing that equipment that they're going to fight in is in the ring on that day. And you can't. You have to be, you have to be comfortable in that equipment, right? If you're going to train That's in boxing gloves. Yeah, yes. training bigger boxing gloves. So Yip Man's guys went over there and they got beat up, all right, because they, they weren't, didn't think they were going to have to fight with a kendo helmet on, right? right? And so they, they were very, yeah, disorder. You can imagine you get punched a little sideways, yeah. that thing turns and you're just not <laughs> used to it, right? Man. And then later, uh, Yip Man was, he was very upset about that. So then they, they trained a second delegation of fighters. And uh, I think they also went to Singapore, but maybe the rules had changed. But then the second delegation went and they did much better because the second time they went, they were prepared. Mm -hmm. And so a Tang Sang had made a, a boxing ring in his backyard. And then they yeah. started actually training in the boxing ring with gloves and equipment and everything on. And then the, the, the group that they sent the second time were just a bunch of bangers. I love Tang Sang. Right? And, and so the second time yeah. they went there, they did much better because oh, they didn't man. just send some people who had never really fought before and then put a bunch of weird equipment on them, right? So... Um, so yeah, so I think to come back to the question again, the reason why you don't see the hooks and uppercuts if you're talking about sport contest fighting is because most Wing Chun people don't even have experience in that because that's not really what we train. Mm -hmm. So they're only going to do the thing that they rely the most on, which is chain punches, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to see these other techniques like the lifting punch and the hooking punch and variations of elbows and stuff like that because they're not used to it. They haven't fought in that kind of arena. They... Uh, have no experience in contests. So how are they going to do any of the low percentage stuff if they don't even have, if they even haven't pressure tested the high percentage stuff, right? And also you have to realize that for self-defense, the strategy in self-defense is different than in sport fighting, okay? Um, 
in in sport fighting, you have to be f- super conditioned. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be in good shape if you have to defend yourself. You absolutely do. Right. But you have to be at a much, much higher level if you're going to go and fight for three rounds even. Or, you know, forget five round, ten round, whatever. Mm-hmm. Or, or MMA rounds, five minutes, three rounds or whatever, right? Just three three-minute rounds. Okay. I mean, the conditioning you need to have to do three three-minute rounds, I think most Wing Chun people would be shocked at the level of cardio and anaerobic conditioning you need to have to be able to not gas out after one minute, yeah. right? And think about it, if, if I'm standing close to you, all right, and, mm-hmm. and you are screaming at me and it's all about self-defense or whatever, and I cannot get you to calm down. And at some point, it's like, I'm going to have to hit this guy, all right? You need to have a, I'm not going to say a one-dimensional strategy because that might give people the wrong impression. You need to have a game plan where you just, you go and you blitz, you shut them down, you stop them from doing anything, you try to stop them before they hurt you. It's very one-dimensional. All right. That's what makes it effective. Whether you're talking about Wing Chun, swarming, getting close, sticking, hitting, not giving them a chance to 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 do anything. Or you talk about something like Tony Blower's system, which is also based on this kind of flinch response, going in with the spear, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, Most practical self-defense styles basically have you kind of go forward in a way where you can close the gap in a way where you're protected and then try to minimize the damage, hit the guy really quickly, put the guy on the ground. It's, 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 they're all based on the same idea, which is exactly why they're all very poor in sport fighting. Uh-huh. Because that one-dimensional strategy that you need to just swarm and shut someone down who's in your face doesn't work when you have someone in front of you and now you have distance back and forth and every time you go forward, they back up. That's what Wing Chun people always learn the first time. There's no element of surprise. Yeah, there's no element of surprise because we're not talking about self-defense. You stand Uh there, a Wing Chun person tries to do a step in with chain punches from way too far away and the other person just fades (laughs) out and they're like, oh shit, Uh, all right? And then they're waiting for that other person to come with a super overly committed attack that they can then do their defense and the other guy doesn't. He just paws with jabs and he's very like, you know, timid and then he just throws a Wing Chun fighter off because what you have trained all right is not this situation now if you want to be able to fight in that situation then you need to learn a little bit about kickboxing or like what we call here at city wing chun street boxing where you you can do stuff at distance and learn how to manage that and feints and covers and all that kind of stuff and then figure out at the right moment either you draw him in or you you set up little traps where you can then go forward and do your wing chun otherwise no you're you're a sitting duck trying to stand square to someone doing chain punches from a football field away it's of course it's not going to work right so the the in my opinion the problem and the reason why i can't give a direct answer to this question is is we're, the problem is the format, okay. all right, of how the Wing Chun fighter is fighting. And, of course, they're, they, can't, they can't do their high percentage stuff. Why are they going to do the low percentage stuff? Um, second, the other thing is a lot of Wing Chun people or people who purport to represent Wing Chun, in my estimation, don't actually have a lot of Wing Chun experience. And what do you mm-hmm. learn in the first you know, year or so of Wing Chun training? Okay, well, you know, with a simple shutdown, packs out, laps out, close the gap. You know, basic defense, defend your head, defend low, step in, close the gap, try to get inside that zone where the person's punches are not as powerful. Like if you stay right at the end range, you're going to eat that punch. Mm. So you're either all the way out or you're all the way in. You're not in that red zone where you're going to get tagged. Most Wing Chun people, I, when I watch videos of some guys here, Wing Chun, they're standing there in the red zone just yeah. waiting to get tagged. It's like, dude, you either got to go all the way out and force the guy to come in or you have to figure out a way to close that gap. You cannot stand there in the red zone getting pieced up with uh, <laughs> hooks and, and jabs and Two stuff like that, and right? Three okay. Pieced, yeah. People sometimes ask me, they go like, oh, what would I do if I had to face a really good Wing Chun person? And I, I say the same thing that my late friend Big Sean Madigan said. I would just jab his face off. Right. They're like, oh, you wouldn't do Wing Chun? We're like, no, why? The average Wing Chun person is trying to use a self-defense frame in a kickboxing format. Yeah. I would just jab his face and kick his legs. All right, non-Wing Chun style. Mm-hmm. And I would do that as a Wing Chun Sifu. Why? Because I use Wing Chun if someone comes up to me and attacks me and I need to defend myself. If I'm going back and forth with someone, oh, I don't need Wing Chun for that. This is not self-defense. Uh-huh. This is not Wing Chun. Yeah. All right, I can do something else. All right, I've done other martial arts before. I would literally just jab their face off. You know, mm-hmm. Why would I do anything else? Well, average Wing Chun fighter in a kickboxing format can't stop a jab. So why would I, why would I think, oh, I need to kick him in the knee and do a lap cell, pack cell. You know, people come <laughs> in, so I would, if I fought a Wing Chun guy, I would like double trap, pack cell, lap, WG, 
like, like really you know your game plan before you would do it. Oh, that damn. shows me how little you actually know about fighting if you're going to tell me the exact five move combo you're going to do on a Wing Chun guy. It's like, no, it never works out that you got way. It all all right? Yeah, right. You got to you got to have to adapt according to Man. the situation, right? So that's got kind of my answer out. for the first question, all right? Um and, uh, and also because beginners just learn the basic stuff, step in and punch, chain punch, ski, you know, big bow tip da, right? pressing steps, nonstop attacks. That's the fundamental Wing Chun stuff. And what I see is a lot of people just learn some of that basic stuff and then they peace out. And then they're always the guys who speak the loudest about what Wing Chun is and what Wing Chun isn't having dipped their balls for one year in Wing Chun, only knowing chain punches, yeah. like, yeah, Wing Chun only has chain punches. Not knowing how, uh. how uh, unlinear the Buji form is, uh. all right? And, uh, and, and then, they, you know, or, or what kind of different uh, looks you get once you've trained the weapons, the knives, the pole, how that changes, how you do your fist fighting, how you kind of free up the way you move. Yeah, but then you got guys who just learned some basic stuff and then oh, Wing Chun only has chain punching. Wing Chun only has this. Wing Chun only has that. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's a fair criticism for considering most people's exposure to Wing Chun. I would also agree with them. Uh, so the second question uh, was something about what, how fast you should learn Wing Chun or something like that. Okay, also, it seems to me like more Sifu structure their students' membership within their association so as to keep them loyal for years and taking more than a decade to learn the entire system, including the weapons. Honestly, at times, I felt like Lung Ting had a similar structure. Having trained in Kung Fu for over 25 years, I know the importance of solid basics and fundamentals, right. but I've also seen some students right. with the ability to pick up okay. quickly. So, uh, so that's a great question. So, um, and of course, this is something I think that's only interesting for people who are a little bit familiar with the various Wing Chun lineages and the, the way they allow students to progress or how slow or how quickly, right? If it's, you know, some, some Wing Chun people are like, oh, no, no, you learn Wing Chun really fast, and then they learn every, all the forms in six months, mm -hmm. and they learn all the chi sao drills and everything like points. that. Right. Yeah, it's one of the selling points. Uh, but they also learn all the forms really fast and the weapons really fast, and, you know, surprise, surprise. Those are the guys who say Wing Chun only has chain punching. Gee. It's like, yeah, homie, the, the entire sum of all of your Wing Chun training is six months. Oh. All right? So al allow me to not be impressed with your take on what Wing Chun has and doesn't have. Because you literally just think it's a collection of, oh, you learn the Sunum Tao, then the Chum Q, and then some Chi Sao drills, and then the Buji, and a couple applications, and then the wooden dummy, and then the... The pole and the, the and, and when they say butterfly swords, then you know they don't know anything because they're not called butterfly swords in Wing Chun, right? The moment somebody says, "Yeah, I learned the butterfly swords in Wing Chun," I just want to just take a nail and stab it through my own eye. All right, it's it's not a butterfly. It's nail. not butterfly yeah. swords in Wing Chun. All right, stop calling it butterfly swords. All right, Man. or moth, butterfly knives or whatever. Swords. Right, so it's not that. All right, they're called not jam though, and even the type of knife we use is not the butterfly swords. Mm -hmm. they're, they're called. Bao Zhang Dou, which is the knife that goes to your elbow, all right? They're not Wu Dip Dou, all right? They're mm. not, but that's from other Kung Fu styles. The knife is shaped differently. The techniques are different. Stop calling them butterfly knives, all right? Ouch. So, um, and Yip Man did not call them butterfly knives in his uh, 72 interviews. So they're called Ba Zhang Dou, all Stop right? That. All right? Yeah. So, but still, like, everyone's like, yeah, I learned, I learned the butterfly knives. I'm like, sure you did. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, um, you know, there's some people who say, oh, well, it takes 10 years to learn the whole system, all right? Mm. As if somehow, uh, one, you have to learn the entire system in order to defend yourself. So the thing about you can learn Wing Chun quickly to be able to defend yourself doesn't mean you learn the entire system. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't know how to fight by the time you learn the knives using Wing Chun, the knives aren't going to do it for no, you. Bro. Okay. So the problem is that it's a, it's a conflation of arguments that gets thrown into the same soup. These are not the same things. You can competently learn how to defend yourself at the Siunam Tao and Chum level with the basic ideas, closing the gap, jamming your opponents, arms and stance, aggressive forward pressure, very direct strikes, punches, elbows, knees, kicks, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then as you get better and you develop your chi sao skills and reactions, you have more options to do that in a smoother and more subtle way than the beginner, all right? Okay. And then when you learn more 
kicking techniques and footwork from the dummy and stuff. You have more options in terms of moving, taking them down, you know, how you unload force, things like that. And on top of that, your experience is what makes you be able to do these things well. Mm -hmm. It's not the fact that you learned the dummy that mm. means you can do it. Mm. All right. And again, these things get conflated. You can learn self-defense skill if you have a good Sifu and a good method in a short period of time without having to learn the whole system, okay? Those are two different things, okay? There's this idea like if you need to learn the whole Wing Chun system before you can fight, then there's a problem with the method. And I don't think that there's even an example of that. Either you can fight or you can't anyway, regardless of what style you take. And two, if you are going to be able to fight with Wing Chun, it should happen before you learn the, the dummy. Mm -hmm. All right. If, if, if you've learned Siunam Tao Chumkyu and Byuji, and it's not until the dummy that you can stop someone from punching you in the face, there's a problem. All right. Mm -hmm. So we need to stop conflating the learning of the entire system with uh, the ability to defend oneself. All right. And the funny thing is, no one ever makes that. Uh, claim about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Do you know how long it takes to get a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Much longer than getting a black belt in any other Budo style. Mm -hmm. All right. You can, if, if you have a competent karate instructor, uh, even very traditional, you can get a black belt in a few years if you train hard because in those styles, a black belt is kind of like the beginning. It's like you've mastered the fundamentals. It's basically what a technician level is in Wing Chun. Technician level, we say, oh, it's like a black belt, but it's more like a karate black belt. It's like you've learned the basics. Yeah. Now you can start. Yeah. You see what I yeah. mean? It is um, I, I would point. say that a, a practitioner or master level in Wing Chun would be more the equivalent in terms of experience of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. I'm not talking about who can beat whom. I'm talking about in terms of experience. Right. It, you don't compare a primary level technician to a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in terms of experience. It, it does not. You, you become a technician in a few years. All right. Uh, it takes you much longer. It can take you 10 can take you 15, can take you 20 years to become a uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. We'll say on the average 10 years. And yes, there's some phenoms who did it in like three years, like BJ Penn and who've done it mm -hmm. shorter, right? Mm -hmm. But those are the outliers. Those are the exceptions, not the rule, yeah. right? But no one says, oh, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they string you along. Damn. Because you don't need to be a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu <laughs> to be able to defend yourself. Okay. All right. So for me, I kind of hear the same thing. It's like, well, how come you just, how come you're making them wait so long to become a black belt? All right. Or like in Wing Chun, let's say a practitioner, like a master or something uh, like that. That's why I don't really like the title master, but let's say a practitioner, like a fourth level or something. Got it. All right. Well, how, how come it takes you 10 years to become a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt if you train like a freaking maniac? Because it's not about all the techniques you learn. It's about how well you can do it. Uh -huh. All right. And there are people who can mimic the forms very quickly. Like, like dancers, for example, they can mimic forms really fast. Great. The that means, that means they got that quick. part down. But you also need to be able to apply that in Qi Sao and sparring and fighting. The fact, Wing Chun is not like other traditional Chinese martial arts where if you can do the form well and explosively and powerfully, they go, all right, you have learned that form. Now you learn the next one. Mm. No, we have other requirements. Mm. You've learned the Siu Nam Tao. You need to be able to do some basics with that with a partner. You learn the Cham Kyo. Okay, you need to show you can do some Qi Sao. You can... Do something with the stuff in those forms, not just do the forms, okay? So it's based on what you can do and how well can you do it. That's how you learn quickly. If we reduce Wing Chun simply to the learning of forms and some drills and then two weapon sets, yeah, I can teach anyone in a short time. But the only thing I would have taught them is to pantomime movements in the air with weapons and a piece of wood and do some stuff in the air and flap their hands around and they can imitate drills as long as those drills look like the drills you're supposed to do <laughs> but then you go and you just fire a random swing at them and that doesn't necessarily mean they have the they skill use because it. it's always the conflation of the system as this thing that you learn this completion you never completely learn anything all right okay. I, yeah, I finished learning the knives years ago still feel like a student in everything. I still feel like I'm exploring Siunam Tao and learning more and, and improving the way I do my footwork and transfer power and my attributes and my ability to apply this stuff because that's, it's just like in boxing. Mm -hmm. How long does it take you to learn boxing? <laughs> All right? If we reduce boxing to the techniques, then I can teach it to you in an hour. Mm. All right? Jab, 
cross, hook, uppercut, all right? Off the lead, off the rear, basic footwork, all right? Feints, movement, mm -hmm. combinations, defense, all right? Those are the techniques of boxing. Yeah. I can teach, I could, you could go through the whole syllabus in an hour. So now, yeah. are you a boxer after one hour? Because you've seen everything. All right? <laughs> I'm no. a boxer. No. Why oh does God. a high-level boxer like Floyd Mayweather, even if he goes and you fight someone now, with all of his experience, why does he still train? Why does he still have a coach? Why does he still have people looking at him and like going, hey, you should do more like this, you should do more like that? All right? Because, bro, he already, le he already learned the whole system of boxing, bro. Mm. All right, because yeah. people think that you learn when you the 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 day you learn the eighth set of the bacham do, okay, you're done. Are you kidding me? All right, not at all. Ugh. All right, so there's this conflation with learning to defend yourself and being able to fight and learning the whole system. These are two different things. Then there's this conflation of because you learned it, does that mean you can actually do it? Like yeah. by boxing analogy, right? And then the other thing is that. Um, People often think that they're ready for stuff that they're not. And you're, it's up to your coach to determine whether the, the students always think, like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready to learn this. Those are always mm -hmm. the ones that are not, right? The student that never asks to learn the next thing uh -huh. is usually the one that goes through the system the quickest because they just show up and train and they're not overly concerned that this guy who started a week after them might be learning the next thing and they're still doing this. They just come in and grind yeah, and grind and grind and grind. That? Yeah. Well, and it, it's learning. this constant outward comparison to the rate of other people, mm -hmm. which takes away the focus from the main thing, which is, dude, you got to train the skills. All right. Now, um, to come to the specific question about Leung Teng Wing Chun and whether they were stringing people along or whatever, right? Uh, there is, there was a difference between the way it was taught in Europe until I would say the last 15, 20 years. Now in the EWTO, they have, um, they focus on other things. Like they focus on um, different internal aspects of martial arts training. They've even integrated grappling and some kind of almost like street boxing way of doing Wing Chun and stuff. So they, they don't, by any accounts, really focus on pure classical Wing Chun, but yeah. you can still learn it in the EWTO. They have, you know, Sifu Giuseppe Schembri is kind of in charge of teaching classical WT for that organization. But basically, if you go to a, an EWTO school, you're going to be focusing on self-defense and you're going to be focusing on like different types of internal things and stuff like that, right? You're not necessarily going to be learning the classic Hong Kong syllabus unless you elect to do that, right? And if you do elect to do it, you can learn it now much more quickly than you could back in the day. So mm -hmm. students nowadays in Europe, they can learn like the pole and the knives and the dummy much quicker than they could back in the day. In the old days, they really made sure that if you just learned Siyunam Tao and Chumkyu, that you were a really tough fighter. I'm talking about the days of Emin Bostep in the early days of Thomas Manis and those guys, all right? Uh, Thomas Rogenkamp, like those guys. They were like, you know, they didn't know all the like, like all the cheese house stuff that you learn in Hong Kong right away. Right. But those guys, they would stand in front of you. Bah, bah, they would just come what they knew they were able to do it. Animals. So there was a much higher level of quality with the basics. And so at that time, the EWTO also focused so much on developing kind of fighters who have mastered the fundamentals of the system rather than just teaching the system. That's, wh that's why in, back in the day, if someone learned Buji, it was like, oh my God, dude, that guy learned Buji. Be like, oh man. Because that was a big deal. That meant that that person had really been around for a while and could really do it. And there was, it's like they had really earned it. And oh. be like, yo, that dude knows the dummy. Yeah. And be like, whoa, that guy learned the dummy. Right. And, and he, then like, and that you, because you know that that, that guy had the basics and mm -hmm. could beat the crap out of you with basic stuff. Yeah. But now he also knows all that other stuff. Right. So they really earned it. And there was something to that. And, but that was on the European, the EWTO side on the Hong Kong side. It wasn't like that on the Hong Kong side. You definitely needed to go through your tests. You need to be show that you could do it in sparring or gossa or whatever. I mean, you had to be scrappy but they didn't have such a high technical standard like they did in Europe. Oh, interesting. So that's why you could learn the system more quickly in Hong Kong, um, and then you would just take more time to practice it and polish it, all right? Um, and so it was a slightly different way of doing it, but still the product was that you could actually really use it. It wasn't just about getting this, the, the, the learning Wing Chun is not a race to the eighth set of Bacham Do. All right. All right, and if you begin Wing Chun, 
uh, with this idea of like, when am I going to learn the knives? When am I going to finish learning the knives? You just don't do Wing Chun. Do something else. Okay? Or just teach yourself that stuff on YouTube. It's all on YouTube and then be done with it. But you don't need to go to an instructor if all you want is the soup to nuts Wing Chun program mm -hmm. in, in six months. Because if, why do you need a teacher to actually teach you by hand and develop skills if you just basically want to pantomime movements with your hands? All right? You don't need a teacher for that. So Europe used to take a really long time to learn it. And then nowadays it's like a lot easier to learn those things. And in Hong Kong, it, it was always basically up to the rate of the student. So this idea that they necessarily strung you along is usually how people felt here in the U.S. because the, the foreign association sometimes had more rules about how quickly you could teach that stuff. Whereas in okay. Europe, Sifu did things his way, right? Mm -hmm. In Hong Kong, Sifu learned things his way. But in all the other countries that represented WT, you had all these middlemen. And the middlemen would be like, well, actually, there should be a two-year waiting period between like this level and this level, and you're only allowed to learn this at this mm -hmm. level. So mm -hmm. these kind of like so artificial the way they learned it. Yeah, artificial waiting times was something more that the international associations had to deal with, right? And yeah, so like to kind of finish his, his question there, um, since I became independent, yeah, I mean, students can learn at their own rate. Mm -hmm. You know, so a student who trains regularly and and trains hard or maybe does additional private lessons or whatever, can learn all of the stuff much more quickly, but they still have to be able to do it. It's not just like, oh, well, I no longer have Sifu Leung Ting as my overlord, so a <laughs> bacham do for everybody, oh, all right? Okay. Oh, you've been here for two months and you can barely stand or punch the wall bag. You want to learn knives? Yeah. No, uh -huh. all right? You, you got to earn it, all right? And there's yeah. always like this, this you're always going to have people who can learn the system very quickly because they're intuitive, they're intelligent, they work hard. And you're going to have people who take longer. And then you're always going to have people who complain about the rate of which you teach it because they feel entitled to learn something more quickly because they go on YouTube and see everyone else doing it. Mm -hmm. And those are usually the people who did not earn it. All right. And uh, everything, uh, it shouldn't take you 10 years to learn the whole Wing Chun system, right? But you should do Wing Chun for much longer than 10 years if you want to get good at it, mm -hmm. all right? You think because you've learned the Batam Do, you now have everything, you've mastered it? Get out of here, all right? Look at people like Sifu David Peterson. When did Sifu David Peterson finish learning the Batam Do from his Sifu Wong Sun Leung? Mm -hmm. I would assume probably in the 80s, maybe the 90s. I would assume in the 80s, though, okay? Why is he still doing Wing Chun? Mm. He, he already learned it. Why, why hasn't he gone on to the next martial art? Because even if a martial art has a simple construction like Wing Chun, that's the art. To be able to apply these simple ideas flexibly in different situations and to get better at them. And as you get older, your martial art evolves because you can't rely on the attributes of your youth. You will never see these things if you don't practice honestly. Mm -hmm. If you just think Wing Chun is about learning some forms, okay, well then you're not going to really, you're not really going to, it's like if you tried to learn jujitsu just by learning the techniques. Mm. You just learn arm bar, I do here, I grab here, I sit, legs in, tum, go like this. Okay, great, triangle choke here. Change of posture, move, pull the head, go like, you, like you could learn it paint by numbers. You could learn an entire blue belt syllabus okay. as simple techniques, like almost learning it like you're learning forms. And now you roll with someone who's been doing jujitsu for six months ah. and you can't do any of it. Uh. So... So did you really learn those movements? Yeah. No, all right? Can't it, apply the it. only thing that matters is what can you do? Mm -hmm. And that was one thing I always appreciated in Hong Kong. Uh, some I Westerner, some, no, 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 no. Some Westerners will say like, uh, uh, what level are you or what did you learn? The Hong Kong guys always ask, what can you do? Because those are two different questions. You might be learning the wooden dummy but you're still learning it and you're kind of green, you can't use it yet. But you might be able to actually apply your Sunum Tao and Chumkyu level stuff. And the Buji, you're still kind of working on it. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, I'm learning wooden dummy, but I, I feel comfortable up to the Chumkyu stuff in actual practice. All right, oh, I'm starting to learn the pole, but I feel comfortable up to Buji in terms of practice, but the, my, my dummy is still not quite there yet. Yeah. You, you, can, you can have different grade levels for the different things you're doing. It's not equal, you don't, everything doesn't go up like this. You know, it's like you have a sketch and then you fill in some color. But the stuff you learn first, that's all full of colors and details. The stuff you're learning now is still black and white. And the stuff you haven't learned yet isn't even a, an outline yet. Mm -hmm. You have to see things on a spectrum and not just go, I learned this. This thing I just learned in Buji last week 
is not on equal footing with the thing I've been doing for the last six years. You have to understand these are, these are all different. So these people always want, um, people ask these questions that on the surface are simple general questions, but actually the, they're multifaceted. They're, there's a lot of different context and um, I cannot give a general answer to specific, specific questions. questions. All right, the, 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 it's, it's, too, it's too simple otherwise. Um, Why well, I spend most of the time just on that one. By the way, I think we have one Patreon question at the top. At the top? Mm -hmm. Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. If you're looking for an easy way to support this podcast, please consider joining the Kung Fu Genius Patreon. You can support for as little as $5 a month and get access to episodes a few days early. Higher levels of support get additional goodies, exclusive content, and even your name in the description. The baller level of support will give you the opportunity to be a Dre for a day and give me a rest from this guy over here. A link for the Kung Fu Genius Patreon page is in the description below. You can also support us by subscribing to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube, liking this video, and sharing it on your social media platforms. When you subscribe on YouTube, don't forget to hit that bell for notifications so you will know as soon as a new episode or a premiere is available for you to watch. For those of us who listen to us on audio, it's a huge help if you don't just rate the podcast, but also write a review wherever you listen to the Kung Fu Genius, such as Apple or Google Podcasts. I really appreciate it. And now back to me. Talking about a uh, Topher Maori question? Yeah, I'm talking about Topher, the original Patreon. They're not they're just the original Patreon, but he was the original not Dre Dre. Dreisen. Yeah, Dreisen made his first appearance on the episode where he was, uh, the, he was Dre for a day. He was the original Dre for the day. I, it wasn't Nick. Oh, you might be right. Yeah. Oh, Nick, how did I forget Nick was Nick. pressing it. Yeah. He was like, yo, I, yo, I want to be on that shit. That's right. But you know what's so funny? What? Um, not, not to say any of our, not, not to call out any kind of racism. Yeah. All right. But in that first season, yeah. all right, so a lot of people didn't know who we are. I mean, most people still don't know who we are. <laughs> but the, the audience uh -huh. um, of KFG, they were still kind of like new. Like if they didn't know me from dudes, uh -huh. if they did know me, they, they didn't know you yet. All right? They yeah. knew me and Sean or maybe they knew me from Howcast or whatever, right? right? And uh, we had that one random episode right. very early on in the season where we just swapped Nick <laughs> <laughs> who's 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 very obviously much darker in complexion yeah. than you all very, right very um and we just i just called him dre the whole episode yes. and i didn't say anything and i remember reading in the comments the number of people who didn't realize that that wasn't you <laughs> <laughs> but they were kind of afraid to say something right okay because they were like all right dre's some kind of black guy yeah. he might be a light-skinned black guy but uh -huh. This other guy's a black guy. I don't know if they're the same guy or not, <laughs> right? And there was this, there was this whole kind of. I remember reading this uh -huh. vibe in the comments, uh -huh. like people were kind of like skirting around. Yeah, is that is like is that whether there was person? the same guy or whatever? Yeah. It was fucking hysterical. Yeah. I should have sent all that back. stuff to Nick. It was we so gotta, funny. We gotta, we gotta uh, do some like back. Back, Back in the, the day, day stuff, yeah. Well, yeah. we, we, we still, I mean, we, we've been doing a lot of AMAs, which is part yeah. of the reason why I want to do like a couple of interviews. Mm -hmm. But we also still have some Best topic of. episodes. We still have to continue the Yip Man. We have to do another Yip Man episode, yeah. right? Um, and then uh, I think there's probably another New York stories in order. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is like all those New York stories I told, those are all the early New York stories. Okay. And uh, the, the problem is I can't, I, I'm a little reticent to, keep saying those stories because it keeps coming closer and closer to present day where Man. some of the like like I, f I feel okay telling the story that happened 12 years ago right with people who are not around anymore like people random people who walked in who yeah. definitely don't have us on their radar right but i'm a little like uh, a little <laughs> self-conscious about telling the story about something that happened five years ago right about maybe someone who walked in because that person might, might not be around up. here in the school yeah. but like might still have us on their radar or mm -hmm. whatever or or sometimes there's stories with students that are not, not you know training anymore and like you know it might sound like i'm not saying the most favorable stuff oh, you know or i'm just using them just for a laugh or whatever so i have to kind of find the new york stories left that are still kind of back in the like back in the day like made some stuff that i missed 
So we'll do another New York stories, maybe another. I you don't know if I can do another archives. Castle stories, but I maybe can do another Germany story, like Germany stories and mm -hmm. stuff, or just stories of the EWTO and things yeah. like that. So we'll do some special topic ones, uh, but uh, also in the last few AMAs, in general, I'm only doing one or two questions an episode now because what we're seeing is like the yeah. quality of the questions are are better. All right. Much better. Cause and so like, I, I'd much rather just spend an episode on one or two topics than like, you know, mm. six or seven nonsense ones. And it also helps me avoid a Dreisen hypothetical. Uh, it, it does. Dreisen. It does. Yeah. Putting I the pathetic it. in hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, so we'll, 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 that is we'll, good. we'll, we'll switch yeah, up the format a little her, bit. But anyway, uh, Topher from Patreon yeah. has a question. What is it? Hello, friends. Now that it's been a month, can we get a review of Cobra Kai oh, Season right. 5? Thanks, as always. I miss my NYC crew. Love, Florida Man. Florida Man, yes. Love, Florida Man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. That's another topic episode we could do. Mm -hmm. But it would have to be a spoilers episode. Shh. So I couldn't put that in a regular podcast because the moment I say, hey, guys, spoilers, anyone who has not seen Cobra Kai is not going to listen to the rest of that podcast. Yeah. So I think we have to do it as a separate standalone thing. The other thing we need to do, which we haven't done in a while, and I know our boys in the comments always send me this stuff. Yeah. We need to do another Beardy episode. Because True. Beardy Beardy is still pumping out He's all still this kind of bullshit, fake Bruce there. Lee stuff. Spewing it. Uh, apparently, People kept sending me a few weeks ago. Apparently Beardy said that he recently uncovered... It's so crazy, like... Please don't say how it. segmented the internet is because the people who follow him are are the weirdest of casual Bruce Lee fans who know oh, who Bruce Lee oh. is but don't know anything about Bruce Lee. But somehow he managed to get hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of those guys. Yeah. But all like the legitimate, like the people who actually have real conversations about Bruce Lee. Those are not the people that he talks about or he's on. I mean, he can make up that Dan and Asanta was a Kempo grandmaster or whatever. Yeah. So apparently, do you remember we did? Um, uh, the different Bruce Lee uh, audio clips, like the Ted Thomas interview. Right. So apparently Beardy played the Ted Thomas interview and then claimed in his video that he was the one who uncovered it. Like, first, <laughs> first of all, first of all, uh, the Ted Thomas thing, all right, cold. has been around for so long. Yeah. All right. And on top of that, we also did an episode on it back, I think, in season one. Okay. All right. And now he puts it out there, like, because he, he tells his audience, and they're all like these weird, the Beardy's fans are like these weird lap dogs, it's right? From under rocks. And, and they're like, oh, he recently uncovered it. Like, they're, they, they, you see in the comments, like, how does he get access to this stuff? It's like, do you not ah. know how to use ah. YouTube, the, yeah. the site that you're literally on right now? Oh, no. You could type in Bruce Lee interview <laughs> and you would see that it was on yeah. there years and years and years ago, right? Okay. But there, it's like the Venn diagram wow. that would explain Beardy's followers <laughs> would have to just be this like confluence of like all of these, these yeah. factors that would silo them from outside information and then somehow come to him, all right? It's bizarre. So I think... Um, we should do a regular series called Beardy's Bruce Lee Bullshit. Yeah. With all Bs. The BBB. Yeah, the BBB. And then no. uh, whenever he comes out with a video, we do like oh. what we did where we both watch it. We just go on for 10 minutes. And we just cut. Yeah. There's a, you know, you know, Brendan Schaub he used to be a UFC fighter. And, okay. uh, and then he became a podcast. He was on Joe Rogan's podcast a lot. And then he, it, and then he had his own podcast. Well, yeah. like he's, he's kind of a dope. And there's like a whole Reddit page, which is about like just making fun of Brendan Schaub. Oh, man. And there's a uh, YouTube channel, uh, Raccoon Tweeties. <laughs> Every right. week, he does a thing called 10 Minutes of Schaub. Oh. Where it's like they just, <laughs> they just play like clips of Brendan Schaub from like his various podcasts. Just like, because he just makes stuff up. And he's, he's just kind of, he's just a he's media. He's awesome right? in that way. Yeah, but, but he's not aware of it. Oh, and, man. And, and he also like copies a lot of stuff that other people say. And like he uses them as his own talking points, right? Um, and this guy just does like 10 minutes of Schaub and it's just him listening to stuff uh, Brendan Schaub says and just like making fun of it and it's hysterical. Yeah. So I think we could do like a Beardy's Bruce Lee bullshit as uh -huh. a 10 minute thing where it's just 10 minutes because you can't watch that stuff for more than yeah. that. Your brain is going to rot, right? Okay. So, um, so anyway, so maybe we can do like a short episode where I do like a, my, mm -hmm. a Cobra Kai review. Yeah. Cobra Kai season five because I, I liked it. There's some people... 
it's when a, do we have to go through season one, two, three, and four as well? Or no? No, this stuff's old. Everyone's seen it's it. It's old. Yeah, just talk about season five. Season it's the five most recent the one, game. right? Yeah. And it's funny. There's some people who don't like Cobra Kai and, and because they expect it I don't know, to be super serious. And it's like, no. have you seen the original Karate Kid films? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, they were like well shot and like they were kind of serious within themselves. But there's a, there's an amount of camp to like <laughs> the bully trope <laughs> in Southern California, right? Yes. And it's like, and it's also like, yes, yeah, part of it is written for kids and, and part of it is nostalgia and... And uh, if people don't see it, then um, then you cannot explain anything to them. That's fine. If you don't see it, it's like, well, I'm, the last thing I'm going to do is waste any of my effort trying to tell you why Cobra Kai is awesome. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't see it, then that's the end of the conversation for me. I mean, like, you know, like I said, you know, if, if you have an average lifespan, you live four, about 4,000 weeks. <laughs> okay. Right? Your whole life is 4,000 weeks. Man. All right. But it's still a lot of weeks. It's a lot of weeks, but here's the thing. You don't have 4,000 weeks from now. 4,000 weeks is your whole life. Oh, damn. You understand? Now I got like 27. Right. Yeah, you got 27 <laughs> weeks left, all right? <laughs> so so the thing is, you know, when, when, you, when you think about something like that, right? Mm-hmm. You have like 4,000 weeks, I think it's about 76 years. It's from the moment you're born. You have, you have, you have 4,000 weeks. That's your whole life. It makes you think about it a little differently. Mm. Like how much time you have, how much time are you going to waste spending like, you know, uh, you know, and I occasionally get like, you know, sometimes a little amped up. Some people say stuff on the internet and I'll go back and forth a little bit. And then I remind myself, what the fuck am I Wait, doing? Man. Well, I'm wasting my time on this shit. I'm in week 3060. Right, exactly. Yeah, I don't have that down. many weeks left. All right? <laughs> right. So you have to like, you have to kind of frame it that way. And when people like argue about entertainment, like, oh, I like the new Star Wars. I don't like the new Star Wars. I like She-Hulk. I don't like the new She-Hulk. I like the new She. I like She-Hulk. Me too. Yeah, but I, I always like She-Hulk. I, I, I like that. I think it's kind of fun. I, I get why some people don't like it. Okay. Like things I can see that I go, yeah, I kind of see it. Like people would expect something different, and it's not what they expect. Uh, I like it. I watch it with my kids, so I think I have a different perspective when I look at it. But I, the thing is, if you can see why someone wouldn't like something. Mm-hmm. And you still like it, but you can go like, yeah, but I can see why you don't like it. Like, dude, I'm Cuban, all right? Yeah. I grew up drinking Malta Goya. Have you ever had Malta Goya? <laughs> of course. All right? Of course. If you did not With grow up drinking meals. Malta Goya, right. all right, and you try that as an adult, it's like sweet syrup garbage, all right? I can drink a Malta Goya mm-hmm. and go, ah, reminds me of my childhood. Yeah. But I can also drink it and go, I can totally understand why if you never had this growing up and you drank it, it's like sickly sweet. I mean, I don't, I drink maybe two a year, all right? Yeah. But I can totally see why you would drink it and be like, oh my you God, this is disgusting. This is disgusting, uh-huh. right? But I totally get it. But the problem is like people have a really hard time under like accepting the fact that someone else absolutely hates the thing that you love. Mm. And no matter, n- no amount of brow beating or trying to convince them otherwise is gonna change it. So bro, if you're lucky, you have 4,000 weeks on this earth total. You are not at week zero right now. Damn. All dude. right? You're already, yeah. you know, uh, uh, some weeks into those 4,000 yeah. weeks, right? So how much time are you gonna spend trying to convince someone of something? So we can do a separate Cobra Kai 5 Review. I'm not going to do like an episode by episode thing or whatever. I mean, for the, it's out anyway, but just kind of my general vibe, things that I like and, and stuff. So maybe we'll do that as well. So All we have right. a lot of like kind of fun content. Cool. So cool. we are just about at I the think, end here. Is I there think. a very short question I could answer super Ooh, quick before we get out of here? Something fluffy. Something is... with no substance and not a Dreisen hypothetical. I got one from G Buck 101. G Buck. G All right. It's like G unit. G U. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's like, like someone in the G unit. G buck. G B U K. What is it? What's the question? Do you do K F G merch? Oh. It would be awesome if you did, especially if you did Dre stuff. Ooh. <laughs> I didn't pre read this. All right, yeah, you didn't pre read this. You was are so full of. thinking maybe Dre doing a pose with the Yip Man shadow being cast in the background t shirt or even a line of shirts with classic Dre quotes on? In the shadow of Yip Man. Wow. They would be awesome. Yeah, wow, I mean, I like people have asked dude. about it. We have, a, we have, we have a couple. Um, <laughs> We have a couple uh, 
you know, every year for my birthday, you make me the uh, the KFG shirt, this right? Is, this and, is true. And you've done it for two years. And oh, every your birthday year, is coming up. My birthday is coming up. So I got to get on that new, right. <laughs> that new shirt. And uh, and and you do it in a different color. First year was like black with like the yellow. It's yeah. like me doing the kick. The gold, and then it's yeah. just KFG on the back, right? And then last year, it was like navy blue with red. It's the 11 right? series. The 1111 series, right? Yeah. Um, and people always ask, like, oh, man, can I get that shirt? But these are, like, just kind of one-offs we've made for ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think we can definitely uh, do some kind of, like, KFG merch at some point. Um, especially, I think T-shirts are probably what people yeah. want. Or maybe, like, you know, bumper stickers with Dreisenisms least, on there. At least the, the shield. Yeah. The KFG shield. Right. Being dope is a skill. Oh. <laughs> that but is like, a Dreism. You have the you have the best lines. That is right? a Dreism, yeah. man. Um, so. The other thing I want to say too, uh, and I talked about it on last week's episode, mm -hmm. is uh, we are now ready to start taking applications for the Hong Kong tour. All right. Uh -huh. So and Mikey Dean is already booked he's his booked. tickets. Yeah, he's yeah. booked. So we tickets. we are going to Hong Kong. Uh, the tour is from August twenty first mm -hmm. to the twenty seventh of two thousand twenty three. So it's mm -hmm. next summer. I have a seven day tour plan for basically. I'm just going to Hong Kong, and basically you can you can um, come on this tour, and I will guide you through Hong Kong. I'm not an official tour guide. It's just Man. hang out with me. I will show you Hong Kong in a way no, locals cannot show you. So we have a couple different tiers of, uh, for the tour. Mm -hmm. So we have like a version of it, which is just the tour, which is like the seven days every day we do something different. Uh, it's going to be a mix of touristy stuff. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, if you come to Hong Kong, you do have to, you know, go to the uh, Jim Sa Choi Pier and, you know, go on the ferry. And there's like some touristy things you have to do. Go to Temple okay. Street or stuff like that. So I, I, I'm I cool will, with that. I will, I will, you know, those things are kind of woven into... Uh, what I call the ultimate Hong Kong Kung Fu tour. Yeah. All right. And, and uh, but what I will do is take you to different places, obviously like Bruce Lee related stuff is with different homes where he learned Wing Chun, the uh, where Yip Man taught in like where the restaurant union was and the mm. Three Prince mm. Temple and uh, go to his grave and, you know, do go to like some movie spots, Ching San Monastery, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's like every day there'll be different things on the docket. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tour. So there's an option if you just want to come on the seven-day tour. Um, I'm going to be in Hong Kong for longer. I'm going to be in Hong Kong for two weeks. But the, the tour itself is only one week. So I have a few days before and a few days after to kind of get ready and decompress afterwards. Yeah. Uh, so anyone's welcome to stay in Hong Kong as long as they like. But I'm only doing the tour from 21st to the 27th. Uh, and it'll be planned every day, and we'll have different things. Go to Kung Fu Corner, also, you know, go all to the, the VTAA. Fixings. Yeah, all, all like the, you know, all the Kung Fu, Wing Chun, Bruce Lee stuff that is, in my opinion, kind of interesting. I'll kind of show you through that stuff. So we have an option for tour only. Then there's a second option, uh, which is the gold package, which is the one like, most people would take, which is the tour plus training. So I'm going to do a three-hour seminar, a uh, Wing Chun seminar in Hong Kong. Mm. So, and um, if I can convince... That's every day seminar? No, 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 no. Every day, three hours? How, how, <laughs> we're going to have time to do anything. Are you kidding me? No. Um, ah. No, we have one seminar for three hours, mm -hmm. probably middle of the week. All right. And then um, if I can convince Maxivu to do like a two hour seminar, I haven't talked to him yet. So, but I, I, I you know, I, I'm, he's done it every time we've gone in the past. Right, so, right. Uh, so if I, if I cannot get Maxivu, I will get, I will get another Sivu to teach something so that people can get an idea of what some other martial arts do. Maybe do like a two hour one, but Maxivu does the best one. He kind of shows like what are the common characteristics of all Southern martial arts compared to Northern, and he kind of gives this, like, yeah. he, he teaches some movements, but it's more about, like, where's Wing Chun's place in this kind of spectrum of different mm -hmm. Chinese martial arts. It's fascinating. So I'll have my three-hour seminar. Maybe we can convince Mak Sifu to do two hours. If not, like I said, I, I, I know many Sifu in Hong Kong, um, but I have a feeling Mak Sifu will do it. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you know, for the seven days, we have the tour and all that stuff. So the second package has, like, the tour plus the training. Mm -hmm. And then there's, a like, a platinum package, which includes one private lesson with me, all right? So it's basically, you get the tour, you get the seminars, and you oh, get one man. private lesson with me, and the reason why I can't do more is because I'm gonna be doing the tour every what day. What if 40 people book one no, 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 I, lesson? No, no, I no, I put a limit on it. So um, there's actually, <laughs> like, like, there's actually a limit on how many people can book that, because okay. I, I don't have the physical time 
Got to it. teach 10 private lessons while I'm in Hong Kong and do a seven day tour, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is possible maybe on some of the days after the tour if they stay, but that would have to be booked separately. Okay. And I will probably charge you a lot because I'm also on vacation and I want to enjoy my vacation. True, true. So there's like, there's a, the highest tier package which includes one private lesson with me, but it's really that gold package, the one in the middle that I think uh, makes the most sense for everyone to do. So there should be, uh, at the in the description of this episode, a link to go to my City WT page, mm -hmm. and there's information on there about the tour, way more detail than I just gave, and there's a questionnaire. So you basically go to the website, read that, fill out the questionnaire. When you fill out the questionnaire, you will get an automated email, which will send you a link for a presentation, which has mm -hmm. even more detail on the trip, and then another PDF, which has all the nitty gritty, like about yeah. food and lodging and all that stuff. The packages, uh, the tours with me are just the tours. So they don't include airfare or accommodations or food because that would just be too difficult to coordinate with people coming from all over the world. Yeah. So airfare- Especially um, uh, vegan. Right, and airfare, accommodations, and food are all on like, are all on the people <laughs> hey, coming in, Mike right? Why is grabbing his mic? Yeah, you know, he's grabbing his mic. <laughs> Mike <dude. laughs> But uh, and, yeah, and also like I just, it's just, it's too much work because I've done this before. And th those are things that, you know, also, if people come, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people might want to stay in an Airbnb with a bunch of other people who are on the tour and other people might want to stay in a swanky hotel because they want to be more comfortable. So I don't want to say these are the accommodations and they're above some people's means and below mm -hmm. what some other people want, right? Gotcha. So, uh, but in these, these uh, presentations and documents that we send to you after you fill out the form, it has all the information there on like, you know, everything, because I don't want anyone to book a tour who's not sure about something. So I, I, I wrote this long ass PDF. It's like yeah. everything you need to know, like cell phones, mobile phones, like how's that gonna work in Hong Kong? What you need to have food, credit mm -hmm. cards, payments, like how, how do you get around Hong Kong? The octopus oh, yeah. card, all the, the things you need card. to know. I gotta break minds back out. Yeah, all the things you need to know to get around Hong Kong, I have it in this PDF. So there's a presentation which shows all the packages and then there's just a long, very wordy text PDF, which has like, these are all the things you need to know. Mm -hmm. You need to read those things. And then when you know which package you want, you contact us and we send you the link and then you buy the tour. The advantage we have now is the tour is next August, okay? So we're very early right now. Oh man. It's the second half of August, so it's super hot in Hong Kong, but the advantage now is, though I checked the flights, the flights are kind of cheap right now, at least from the States. Partially because it's late August. Early August is more expensive because I think there's some uh, conventions in Hong Kong. But late August is a little bit cheaper. It's also mm -hmm. hot as hell. And the other reason it's cheap is it's, it's almost a year out. I mean, a little bit. It's less than a year out, but it, yeah. we were still way in advance. So that's the reason why I wanted to get this thing ready so that if people need to save some money or uh, you know they want to purchase it now and pay off their credit card over six yeah. months before they go to Hong Kong, they okay. can do it as soon as possible. We have the dates, we mm -hmm. have all the information and people can buy the tour. So you purchase the tour with me and then you get your airfare and accommodations on your own. I have stuff in the PDF to tell you where you should get, what area you should get your hotel in based on where we're yeah, meeting so and we're stuff like that. Yeah, so neutral area, right. Yeah, so it's all, um, it's, it's all in there, I'm super excited. I tentatively would like to bring 15 people. I think I can bring up to 20. Mm. Um, but uh, more than that, I'm gonna have to see if we have more than, I don't know. I mean, two people might sign up, I have no idea. Uh, 10, 20 people might sign up. But if I do get more people signing up, then I may hire some local people in Hong Kong to help me with the tour. Okay. Because uh, it would be difficult for me. I don't want to walk with 30 people behind. You know how crowded Hong Kong is, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be walking with 30 people behind me and have to have a bullhorn or something would like that. Would you hire right? Chen Ji Man's daughter? Uh, no, she's busy. She's working. Uh, no, man, I, I, she's, I, uh, she's cool. I, yeah, she's super cool. No, I have, I, have, I have plenty of friends in Hong Kong that I think can help out with something oh, right. like this. So, um, yeah, so anyway, so that is the 2023 Ultimate Hong Kong Kung Fu Tour with the Kung Fu Genius, uh, which is from August 21st Sweet. to the 27th next year. And the information, the link to sign up for info is in the description below. 
sign up, mm -hmm. get that info, read it over, all right? I okay. mean, if you still have questions, you can email our headquarters, but I did my best to be as thorough as possible because I wanted it to be absolutely clear because I want everyone to have a good time. Okay. So that's why I said stuff like, if you don't like hot weather, you don't like ACs, all right? You have a very restrictive diet. Uh, those might be factors why you might not want you to know, do this, but I want them to know that in advance. Right. Yeah. You know, there's someone who loves hot weather, Dreisen, I heard. If Dreisen comes on this trip, he can come for free just so I can beat his ass. And that's all I gotta say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius, like this episode, hit that bell for notifications. And if you have any questions you want me to answer on a future episode, go ahead and write those in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. I'm on purpose f***ing them up for dad jokes. We haven't had dad jokes in a while. I don't have dad jokes in front of me. I don't have that many. Yeah, and also, Dre, sit closer to your microphone. Such a pro. Me too, right. I'm a pro. Yeah, pro what? Lots of gems, lots of 10 years to learn Wing Chun, lots of, yo, the KFG got mad surprises, announcements coming up. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> lots of surprises, announcements. 10 lots years to get this uh, intro done. Hey, I resent that. You <laughs> resemble that. All right, hey. let's go. For your ass? For your ass? Oh What's my God. That? No, that's fine. <laughs> Just beep that out, Andrew. All right. Yay! Yeah. Yeah.